Well, thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you all for coming. I want to thank everyone at Hogue for having me. I think it's a, a very important topic, and I hope you all find this afternoon that it is also a very interesting uh, and vital topic that really crosses over many areas in medicine when we talk about the dermatologic manifestations of a systemic disease. So what I'd like to do as part of my objective is to first tell you that when we talk about dermatology, everything is very descriptive, as you know. So I'm going to take some time to remind you of the descriptive terms and the various morphologies of skin lesions. How do we describe skin lesions? What are the different types of skin lesions based on their appearance, size, depth, etc.? So I will give you a little refresher first on the terminology of the descriptors, the descriptive language of dermatologic uh, skin findings. And then I'm going to start to go through some key organ systems and talk to you about ways that the skin itself can be a window into the internal uh, disease. In other words, skin findings that may occur in a variety of different systemic conditions that may occur. So as I mentioned, first we'll start with a brief review of some key terminology. And again, when we look at a lesion or a group of lesions, we try to be as specific as possible in our descriptions. How do we describe these lesions? And the other point here, and that's why I, I title this simple acne, one might look at it, something on the skin that appears to be simple and straightforward, but it could actually have a broad differential diagnosis. So something that is assumed to be acne, for instance, might not be your garden variety acne. This could be a, a drug effect or a, a drug reaction. So just as one example, we see a variety of medicine-induced um, skin reactions that occur in all areas of medicine, right? And that could be something as simple as an acne-like reaction, what we call acneiform drug eruption that can occur due to chemotherapy or any variety of topical or oral medications. And so, but when we describe lesions, remember we describe this uh, group of lesions as uh, uh, erythematous papules, meaning that these are raised lesions, raised bumps on the skin. There are also pustules, which uh, denotes the presence of uh, pus-filled lesions, uh, usually indicative of some sort of infection, so erythematous pustules, papules, and perhaps open comedones, which are the so-called blackheads that you see in acne. So I just thought this was, uh, and I'm, you're going to see a lot of photos, because I think dermatology clearly is very visual, so we need to illustrate these examples through pictures. You have a patient here, for instance, that presents with uh, what I would describe as grouped erythematous uh, macules. So this might be described as a maculopapular eruption, confluent, meaning that these lesions sort of come together, forming a pattern. And that pattern is of erythema or redness coalescing. And this, is a, uh, this could be, a, of course, a variety of different conditions. But one key thing to consider excuse me, would be a drug eruption of some kind. So a medicine-induced drug eruption or some other type of uh, 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 eruption on the skin. Uh, also a viral rash, so-called viral exanthem, meaning that this is a, that uh, means that you have a viral-induced skin eruption. So the viral exanthem of measles, for instance, uh, versus a drug reaction. So this is just, again, giving you a little bit of an introduction to some of the terms that we use, and some of the variety of clinical presentations. The uh, obvious uh, severity of something like this would certainly justify a consultation uh, with a dermatologist to ascertain the, the uh, trigger of this eruption. Again, when you see something like this, we think of drug eruption, we think of some other type of reaction, uh, burn, some, something that, some trauma. This would be described as desquamation of the skin, where you have sheets of skin, denudation. If the skin is denuded, what that means is that the skin is lifting off or sloughing off, if you will, desquamation. So I'm giving you all these terms just as reminders in our descriptions. Erosions, meaning the skin is broken down, and then when it is broken down further, we call that ulceration. Okay, so we talk about uh, the descriptions based on the arrangement, distribution, shape, and type. Sorry for the typo there. And then we have what we call primary lesions, secondary lesions, and then descriptions based on the color, 
and then descript descriptions based on whether you can feel the surface of the lesion. Is the rash raised and palpable, meaning you can touch it, or is it macular, meaning that it's flat? And so just a quick reminder here, this is uh, the description of what we call a macule or a patch. These are, by definition, flat. There's no elevation, right? So if the lesion is less than one centimeter, then it is a macule. If it's greater than one centimeter, it is a patch. So we're talking about examples of flat lesions. So this would be a patch, right? This would be a large uh, patch that is flat. And you, if you run your hand over the surface, there's no appreciable elevation versus a plaque, which would be circumscribed and that there would be a, some solid elevation. So if it's a greater than one centimeter, we call it a plaque. If it's smaller, we call it a papule, like you saw in the beginning with the acne patient with those bumps. So-called bumps would be papules, and a larger area that's uh, maybe flat-topped but raised definitely would be a plaque. And so this would be an example of, a pl of plaques, right, that uh, one might consider psoriasis, uh, for instance, where a patient presents with elevated erythematous scaly plaques, these large scaly plaques, typically on the, on the extensor surface of the forearms, also on the elbows and uh, elbows, knees, classically scalp as well. But, but the point being that just illustrating these palpable lesions here. I mentioned papules. These are the smaller bumps. This, these are uh, hyperpigmented, meaning that there is a greater degree of pigmentation in these lesions compared to the surrounding skin. So there's a pigmentary response, perhaps what we call post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation as a result of trauma. And this can occur in all skin types, but may be more pronounced, by the way, in patients uh, with skin of color, where the skin is darker and more sensitive to the effects of inflammation, leaving us with these scattered hyperpigmented papules. Nodules, then, would be something like this, perhaps a basal cell or squamous cell carcinoma, where you see this rolled border and you see this elevated component, but there's nodularity, meaning that if you, run your, if you squeeze it later, you know, medially from the lateral sides, there's substance to it. It feels as though there's something underneath, like a marble. So there's a nodular component. That's what we call a nodule. Vesicles, these are, again, uh, distinguished by what we call bulli, a bulla, is uh, larger than 0.5 centimeters. A vesicle is, large, is, uh, is 0.5 centimeters or less. These are blisters. And so we have different terms for blisters on the skin based on the size of the lesion. And if they are larger, they are bulli, singular is bulla. And if they are uh, small little uh, uh, vesicles or blisters, they are called vesicles. Okay? And these would be examples here where you see these grouped uh, erythematous uh, grouped vesicles with erythema, and so this would be very characteristic of something like shingles, zoster, for instance, where you see the grouped uh, vesicles. Okay, small little water blisters as opposed to these large ones, and you can appreciate that these are significantly larger, right? These are larger in size, they are tense, meaning that if you pressed, um, they, there's some tension, almost like a water balloon that's erupting, and this is what we call bulla formation, and the, probably the most common clinical condition you would uh, see this would be uh, bullous pemphigoid, which is a blistering condition that is common in our elderly population or older patients. Uh, bullous pemphigoid can also um, uh, range in severity. And, but then also when you see something like this, you have to think about trauma. Uh, maybe this is trauma-induced. Uh, was there some history of trauma that caused blistering? Of course, burns, something like that that would lead to bulla formation. Yep. Are we not hearing you as well? Okay. Or you're not hearing me as well. Okay. So this would be uh, the next lesion that we describe, pustules. Pustule formation uh, would be characterized by the presence of a yellow or white-looking uh, Exudate, it would be some drainage if you squeezed it or if you lanced it with an 11 blade, for instance. So this would be a, uh, a pustule, okay? And uh, the, by the way, these don't necessarily need to be infectious. You can have what we call sterile pustules. A sterile pustule means that you have a pus-filled pimple, you drain it, you culture it, and it's negative. Normal, it's just, it's negative for staph, for instance, or any other uh, pathogenic skin flora. So. This is a so-called sterile pustule, as opposed to a pustule that would be uh, a staph or other infectious uh, 
nature, a variety of different potential causes, of course. And then uh, as we finish off, just a few more before we go into the, uh, some key findings in systemic diseases, we have wheels. Wheels are these firm, swollen plaques. So these are said to be edematous. So edema, as you know, is intercellular uh, some water accumulation and, and swelling. So this firm edematous, uh, what you might call spongiosis under the microscope, that's a pathologic term for the skin, spongiotic process where there is uh, fluid accumulation, intracellular edema under the microscope, and you see these wheels. Okay, so you see infiltrated fluid, and that may cause blanching, usually transient. Uh, wheels are characterized by this urticarial-like appearance, and this would be a classic uh, finding in hives, for example. Scale, uh, going back to stratum corium, the surface layer of the skin becomes uh, perceptible. There's scale, there's uh, desquamation, shedding, and you can see here, there's, uh, of course, I mentioned earlier, psoriasis. Uh, we see the presence of these uh, red or erythematous plaques that are scaly. So there's desquamation, shedding, if you will. Crust, so again, you see crusting, scabbing, some purulent drainage or bloody drainage. That would be described as a crusting reaction. What would be this? This could be common in uh, the staph or impetigo, staph or strep impetigo, when the areas become crusted and they leave that honey-colored uh, crust that is described as impetigenization, meaning that this is like an impetigo-like process, typically periorally because of the presence of the saliva uh, and other factors and breakdown in the skin where you see the uh, ability of staph and strep to proliferate, staph or strep to proliferate. And then we have thickening of the skin. We have lichenification, and that describes a leathery thickening of all skin layers, uh, both the epidermis and the dermis. And you can see this very commonly in atopic dermatitis. You see this as a result of scratching, right? After trauma, chronic trauma from scratching induces a reaction in the skin where the skin becomes thickened, leathery. And by the way, it also becomes hyperpigmented. So you see this hyperpigmentation, which again we see commonly in patients with darker skin types, where you see the hyperpigmented, lichenified plaques that you can feel. And that is, uh, by the way, a very common finding in atopic dermatitis or atopic eczema in children, but also in adults. Erosion, where the skin gets broken down, this typically heals without scarring. Focal loss of the epidermis, the loss does not penetrate into the dermis, so you have this, again, sloughing, like eroded area. Here, these can be seen in a variety of systemic diseases. Uh, you can have this as a result of a systemic drug eruption and uh, other, other items. And then we'll just kind of move on, because uh, in the interest of time, to get to some systemic manifestations here. But I wanted to show you plenty of visuals and descriptive terms. This is, of course, an ulcer, ulceration. Ulcers may be well circumscribed or poorly circumscribed. And the differential for lower extremity ulcers, for example, are broad. You can have hypertensive ulcers. You can have diabetic-related uh, ulcers where you have poor circulation. You can have trauma-induced ulceration. You can have ulceration as a result of systemic disease, and we'll talk about that in a moment. You can have atrophy, of course, where you have focal depression of the skin. So it's not flat and it's not raised, but it's flat. It's uh, depressed. There's a noticeable depression. This can be seen as a result of a variety of skin conditions, but can also be seen in, uh, iatrogenically after uh, injection with uh, certain steroid shots, we, because uh, steroid uh, shots intralesionally or intramuscularly can, in some cases, induce atrophy, focal atrophy to the skin. Excoriation from scratching as well, and then fissuring where the skin is broken down. Okay. So obviously there's so, much, so many different descriptive terms, scarring where you get keloid formation. This can be seen as a result of surgery, uh, trauma of any kind. We see this uh, in all patients of all different skin types. When we talk about the color of the skin, we talk about depigmentation. Depigmentation, this would be seen in vitiligo, for instance. And so this could be uh, in some cases associated with thyroid disease, not always, often hereditary, but you see a complete loss of pigment and patches of what we call depigmentation. Not hypopigmentation, but depigmentation where the skin is lost. So again, we, we look at terms based on color, 
Uh, we, we describe things based on palpation, whether we can feel them, margination, is it well-defined or poorly defined? So this might be, you might have a, a well, ill-defined versus well-defined border. This might be a cellulitis where you have soft tissue infection due to staph or strep, for instance. Morphology is described obviously based on shape. This is a ring-shaped like configuration, so-called annular, A-N-N-U-L-A-R, annular, like a ring, like a wedding band. This is an annular plaque, scaly annular plaques. This might be seen in a tinea corporis, which is fungal infection of the skin, of course, or uh, you know, a variety of other, other conditions. Okay, so just more descriptive terms based on the shape. We look at the shape. This is uh, said to be serpiginous, meaning that it's almost like a winding snake-like configuration of the skin, and this could be due to a parasitic infection. Um, in the case of this, this is what we call cutaneous larva migrans, which is a uh, common in, in tropical areas in Florida, for instance, where more common where you see uh, infiltration in the skin. So again, the shape, the point of showing you these slides is that the shape plays a key role. The arrangement also, is it lateral, is it bilateral, is it zosteriform, meaning that it follows a pattern like zoster, herpes zoster, herpes shingles, is it arranged linearly, this is a linear distribution of a rash. These are all clues into the etiology. How is it arranged? Um, and then distribution, of course, and whether it's bilateral and so forth. Okay, so I think I've shown you a lot of terms here that give us some groundwork to really dive into the cutaneous manifestations of some, some systemic diseases. It would be impossible in one lecture to cover all of this, but we'll do the best we can. And we'll start with some key conditions. We're going to review a lot with related to diabetes-related skin disease. Uh, or skin findings, uh, renally, uh, renal patients that have skin findings, gastrointestinal disorders, rheumatologic disease, connective tissue disease, hepatitis C, thyroid disease, and then those skin conditions that can be hallmark findings that might indicate to us that the patient has an underlying unidentified or so-called occult malignancy. So some skin findings, though rare, may be a clue that there is a malignancy that is hidden or unidentified. And then nutritional disease as well. So for diabetes, what are the more common skin manifestations of diabetes? Well, we have what's called acanthosis nigricans, diabetic dermopathy, bolus diabeticorum, necrobiosis lipoidica, and then the diabetic foot ulcers. And I'm going to take you through each of these. Acanthosis nigricans is more common in patients with darker skin, patients of uh, Hispanic or African American descent, but not exclusive to those patient populations, also seen in Caucasians and is commonly associated with obesity and insulin resistance. This condition is described as having a rash of pigmented, hyperpigmented, velvety, soft plaques of the flexural areas on arms, neck, skin folds. And then there's a genetic sensitivity of the skin to hyperinsulinemia. There also may be a rare variant associated with gastro, uh, gastric uh, carcinoma. So what does this look like? Here you see these velvety, hyperpigmented plaques of a patient with acanthosis nigricans. This might be an adolescent or pre-adolescent uh, with uh, diabetes or insulin resistance where you see these hyperpigmented plaques and the patient comes to you telling you that they've been washing it off and they just can't get it off. And it's not going to just be washed off because it's a change in the skin texture related to the insulin resistance slash diabetes. And then here you see under the arms and in the, in the axilla, the uh, hot hyperpigmented patches there. Patches and or plaques. How about another one on the legs, shin spots? We see patients all the time with this, diabetic dermopathy. This is actually among the most common cutaneous manifestations of diabetes. Patients have benign asymptomatic red macules on the shins, meaning that these spots are flat and there's no real, real treatment needed. So you see a patient who comes in and has these pigmented lesions. They're flat. They're not palpable. They're not going away. The patient is concerned that there is some discoloration and why is this happening. And this often is related to the underlying diabetes. This is also very much similar to what we call stasis dermatitis, where you get uh, increased uh, or poor blood flow and therefore you get deposition of what's called hemosiderin, which contains iron and it imparts that iron-like dark hue to the color of the skin. So the color is iron. It's hemosiderin that is leaked out of the broken capillaries as a result of capillary leakage related all back to 
the systemic disease of poor circulation and particularly prominent in patients with uh, diabetes due to poor circulation. Rapid onset of painless, tense blisters on the hands and feet. This is called dot bolus, meaning blistering diabetic corum. And this is, uh, again, maybe uh, trauma-induced, spontaneously heals within about a month to a month and a half, and patients will get on acrocytes, meaning on their arms or legs, they can get these uh, spontaneous blisters. Okay, so uh, this is very important actually for type 1 diabetics, um, NLD, uh, necrobiosis lipoidica. This affects a, um, a large percentage of, of our patients that come in and have these unexplained lesions on the lower legs. They typically look yellowish and atrophic, meaning flat, and it's 20, 20 to 35% of patients with this condition that have diabetes, and it, it is predominantly type 1 diabetics. It occurs on the shins. It may ulcerate if it's not treated. It does not respond to topical therapy as well because it's a deep dermal process, meaning that you need intralesional shots or you need systemic therapy really to clear it. And glucose control does not clear it. And so that's the other frustrating thing I would point out. For a lot of these skin conditions with diabetics, the assumption might be, well, let's get their glucose under control. Let's get back into normal glycemic control, and that will help your skin lesions resolve. And unfortunately, it doesn't correlate that way, such that these lesions can persist even if the patient is well controlled with their blood glucose. And this is what this looks like. So this is NLD, and this is these atrophic, even ulcerated plaques, and this is certainly ulcerated here. Now, the reason this is important to identify is uh, many times patients will come in and they have been treated numerous times with antibiotics, and they are assumed to have had persistent uh, staph infections or some other type of infection. They go to infectious disease, they're on IV antibiotics, nobody can clear them up, and in fact, it's because this is a non-infectious etiology. This is not an infection. This is a specific skin disease, uh, as I said, in type 1 diabetics predominantly. And the frustrating thing is that the antibiotics will help if there's secondary infection, but it doesn't help with the primary cause. So of course, when you have ulcers like this on the legs, you're going to have a susceptibility to secondary infection. But uh, the fundamental treatment is not, with, with, it's not to treat it as infectious. What about patients that come in and they have these sudden crops or groups of yellow papules, yellow bumps all over their face, eyes, maybe their elbows, tendons? These are called xanthomas. Xanthomas, this comes from a prefix meaning fat-derived. Xanthomas are seen in uncontrolled diabetics, but also in hypertriglyceridemia. So patients, and this is a very important pearl, can have so, such high cholesterol or triglyceride levels that they actually uh, will deposit fat into their tissue in the skin, and they develop xanthomas. They are called eruptive, meaning they're very sudden and quick. So we have diagnosed patients with hyperlipidemia, extreme hyperlipidemia, particularly familial types, genetic types, based solely on the skin appearance of these yellow papules, and then we do the biopsy to confirm it, and of course blood work to, to confirm the uh, abnormal lipid, lipid levels. But know that this also does occur in your diabetic patient population, uh, and they do get this sudden uh, crops of these firm non-tender non yellow bumps. It doesn't bother the patient. Um, roughly speaking, about 50% of xanthomas in general are associated with hyperlipidemia, not necessarily in the diabetic population. And then control, uh, the, in this case, controlling the glucose and lipid reduction does help reduce the lesions, but it doesn't eliminate them. This is an example of these eruptive xanthomas, which actually look red and pink at the base, but if you look up closely, they're actually yellow in color. Of course, we know that with diabetics, patients are, um, have poor, due to the, the microcirculation problems and other problems of diabetes, with the, uh, the underlying disease, they are susceptible to ulcers. And this is certainly an important factor. We are concerned about the care of our di diabetic patients with the lower legs. Um, and so you can develop, of course, peripheral neuropathy, the inability to detect the pain, and so that trauma might not uh, be registered as a painful event, so they don't access care as quickly, and then they go on to develop an ulcer that becomes secondarily infected, and then the next thing you know, they're in wound care and they're having problems ambulating and functioning, and they can even develop systemic infections from there. And there's a risk of amputation that goes up significantly once these uh, 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 neuropathic, really, ulcers develop. Um, uh, it's really a neuropathic, not neurotropic, but really a neuropathic. I, I prefer that term, neuropathic ulcers. They can, of course, get vascular complications that leads to more ulceration, and it becomes a positive feedback cycle. And this is an example of a patient who has a, a, a neuro, neuropathic 
ulceration on the distal aspects of the toes. Obviously, this becomes ulcerated and gangrene can develop. And uh, if they have neuropathy, they may not even feel this, and they may not come in to seek help. Another condition in differential diagnosis, though less common in, in our area of the world, would be leprosy. Patients develop from leprosy this uh, destruction of the nerves, the skin cutaneous nerves, and they can have these terrible ulcerations on the tip of, tips of their toes, not even feel the pain, and then the next thing you know, the gangrene develops and they need amputation, but cutaneous manifestation of leprosy, there's a systemic disease we don't see as much, but certainly to keep in mind that there is a differential for this. And if the patient has no pain, you have to be very concerned about nerve damage, obviously. So let's move a little bit. Um, renal disease, and that should be US. I apologize for the misspelling. Puritis is the number one manifestation that in, in our field that we really see for our renal patients. W what that means is that patients that are on dialysis or have renal disease, they often have severe itch, intractable itch. Sometimes they have itch to the point where they cannot sleep at all at night. And regular blend, you know, emollients really are not sufficient. They need something uh, systemic uh, often for control of the severe uncomfortable itch. These patients often have dry skin as well, and they can develop some very specific conditions uh, in renal patients. One is called uh, perforating disease, one is called calciphylaxis, and one is called nephrogenic fibrosing dermopathy. So as I mentioned already, puritis or itch is the most common cutaneous finding in our renal patient population. And I think it's sometimes undertreated and underrecognized. And uh, because, as I mentioned, bland emollients are just not enough for these patients. They, they need more aggressive therapy in some cases. Seen in both peritoneal and hemodialysis patients, so both forms of dialysis uh, patients. And then there's an unknown mechanism. We don't really know how it works, but there's cer certainly uh, unsatisfactory therapy. We do find that phototherapy may be of some benefit. Um, and again, with the um, many different manifestations of different systemic disease skin findings, I'm focusing my talk more on uh, the recognition, early detection, and need for uh, referral and things of that nature, as opposed to specific treatment modalities uh, with our time uh, constraints this afternoon. But here you have a patient, a, a dialysis patient with renal disease and has excoriations from severe itch. They're scratching. They also develop these nodules. There's something called perforating disease, which I'll tell you now. There's acquired perforating dermatosis, where they develop these papules and nodules. Um, and that's actually what this is uh, depicting. And it's very similar looking to this, where they develop these bumps on the skin. So perforating disease. Very, very disturbing for the patient. And they are, uh, it's not, you know, they often blame themselves. They're itching, and they think it's their fault. You know, there's nothing, this is a real organic cause related to the uh, kidney disease, perhaps obviously related to the buildup of certain toxins. We don't really know exactly the mechanism of why our renal patients have such severe itch, but they do develop these nodules, sometimes what are called pyrigo-like nodules, and often uh, they are very miserable. Here you see more uh, he uh, lesions here where they have this central keratotic ulceration. Obviously, they're itching, so they're picking, and then they continue to pick, and then they get secondary infection, and then the whole cycle continues, much like the cycle we talked earlier about the ulceration in the diabetics. Um, other less common but severe conditions in renal patients, what's called calciphylaxis. Calciphylaxis is a condition of very painful purpuric, meaning purple-like hemorrhagic plaques, and retiform purpura. Retiform purpura means uh, purpuric lesions that form net-like configuration. Retiform means net-like, and so it looks almost like a, a net with lacy, uh, lacy appearance uh, on there on the skin, and they get hemorrhagic lesions too. And this is thought to be related to uh, poor um, uh, electrolyte Im imbalance, obviously, with these patients with their uh, renal disease and, and uh, with uh, uh, alteration in the parathyroid hormone levels and things of that nature. Um, and then more proximal lesions can have generally a worse prognosis. So here would be a patient with hemorrhagic purpuric lesions that ulcerate, on, and this can be life-threatening. The patients develop quick necrosis, risk for secondary infection. So again, a lot I'm showing you today is ulceration, uh, and this is because many manifestations in the skin of systemic disease present themselves as ulcers. How about a... Uh, Another condition that's more newly described in the last, I believe, in the last 10 years or so, and this is a, 
nephrogenic fibrosing dermopathy. This is interesting because this is associated with the uh, exposure of patients to gadolinium contrast. And this is uh, described as a very thickened, woody, indurated uh, plaque formation with what's called a peau d'orange appearance, which means that this almost the surface of the skin almost resembles the surface of an orange with the, uh, the pitting-like appearance of a, of, a, of a ripe orange and uh, with that thickening too. Usually spares the face, palms, and soles, but can be very severe. And, and again, they get this woody induration. They get thickening here of the skin, sometimes hard to appreciate. Um, again, sparing palms and soles, but they can have a difficulty with contraction and things of that nature. So gastrointestinal dis disorders, whole next category, patients with uh, gluten sensitivity are often sensi uh, uh, susceptible to what's called dermatitis herpetiformis in our gluten sensitive population, and then inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, and then what's called henoch schonlein purpura, which is a type of vasculitis. Vasculitis itself is a topic all on its own. Vasculitis is very complex. I think it's one of the probably two or three most, most complex topics in, in dermatology is vasculitis. And so these patients develop what's called palpable purpura, which means they develop these purple-like hemorrhagic lesions, and they are palpable. You can touch them. They're raised. And they, again, develop necrotic ulcers, and they uh, can be on the buttocks classically in children, usually under 20, often following an upper respiratory infection, sometimes strep-associated. And this is what's called an IgA vasculitis. And they develop GI symptoms. They can develop severe uh, discomfort, diarrhea, et cetera, with or without arthritis. And they can also have uh, renal involvement and hypertension. So this is HSP, henoch-tronline purpura. This would be a child under 20 after a you know, URI or strep exposure may develop this type of reaction. And this is a systemic manifestation uh, um, or excuse me, a cutaneous manifestation of, of uh, GI-related uh, underlying vasculitis with uh, uh, GI symptoms. Also on the legs here and the feet, you see these hemorrhagic coalescing papules and patches there. And then next we have dermatitis herpetiformis. Dermatitis herpetiformis is very itchy, one of the most severely itchy conditions we know. Group vesicles, they also can be anywhere on the body, often on the buttocks and they are associated with HLA-DQ2, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, lymphoma, and insulin-dependent diabetes. Um, the cutaneous findings are, are due to autoantibodies to an enzyme called transglutaminase. And these patients, uh, fortunately, there is a, a mainstay of treatment in, in uh, systemic DAP zone uh, is considered the treatment of choice for these patients. But this is uh, in our gluten-sensitive enteropathy patients commonly, not exclusively, but commonly. And you see how they have these nonspecific excoriations. Again, that, you know, this could be a hundred different things, right? So the key is the clinical history. Do you have a history of gluten sensitivity? Are you gluten sensitive? Yes. Are you itching a lot? Yes. And then the distribution of the lesions should lead you to this. And then, of course, a skin biopsy would help confirm this. Nothing like this would be identified just solely based on I think history and a diagnosis by the naked eye. You would need a biopsy to confirm this. Uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, of course. You see uh, in Crohn's, we talk about how Crohn's can affect anywhere in the body from the mouth to the anus. And you can have uh, this sort of distribution of linear ulcerations with a cobblestone-like appearance in the oral mucosa. Ulcerative colitis patients may have aphthous ulcers that develop as the IBD flares. Crohn's patients may also have what's called metastatic uh, Crohn's in the per perineal area where they develop these severe fissures and plaques and ulcers. And this uh, can be very serious and leads to secondary infection. Patients with Crohn's, uh, you see more commonly you know, ulcerative colitis will develop or can develop these painful tender nodules on the lower legs. This is a condition that's really not that uncommon. It's called erythema nodosum. Erythema nodosum may be drug-induced. It's related to estrogen, oral contraceptives. May also be related to strep and to mycobacterial infection, tuberculosis, also sarcoidosis. So a patient presents like this with a chronic cough and they have a pulmonary uh, sarcoidosis that's become systemic and they may also have erythema nodosum related to their sarcoidosis. So when I see a patient like this, I worry about, do, I worry about, uh, I ask about cough, I ask about pulmonary symptoms, I also consider a chest x-ray, I'm also concerned about medication history, 
TB exposure, travel history, um, might need a PPD uh, to rule out anything with TB, and also, of course, ask them about uh, diarrhea or ulcerative colitis related symptoms. Okay. Pyodermic gangrenosum is uh, very commonly seen in our uh, patient population in ulcerative colitis. And this is another horrible disease with, again, ulceration. You see the pattern across all these disease states in systems. Ulceration occurring. But the problem is that the diagnosis is often delayed. It's assumed to be infectious. There's no infection. They're, they do not clear up with the typical antibiotic therapy, even intravenous antibiotics, because it's, it's not, it's sterile. They're typically sterile ulcers, and they can be frequently on the legs. They can occur around stoma sites in patients that have had um, removal of part of the colon, and so it can be very severe and often requires systemic steroids. Rheumatologic disorders, connective tissue disease, lupus, dermatomyositis, and writers are three that I chose in our limited time as we finish up, but wanted to mention to you some classifications of some important skin conditions. Now, you can have systemic skin lupus, and you can have cutaneous lupus. So a patient with SLE, systemic lupus, may or may not have a facial skin rash of lupus. So you can also have a patient that has skin-limited lupus, meaning you can have lupus in your skin, but that doesn't mean you have systemic lupus. You can be ANA negative, right, with skin lupus. So I think that's an important distinction, is that in dermatology, we do take care of a lot of patients that have skin lupus, but that doesn't mean that they have systemic lupus. It's not 100% correlated. Just like, for example, we have patients with psoriatic arthritis that have psoriasis and arthritis, but, but you can't correlate the extent of their skin disease with the extent of their joint disease. Um, and so the point here is that we have a variety of forms of lupus that I manage in the clinic in the skin, and this can range from neonatal lupus to discoid lupus to what's called SCLE, subacute cutaneous lupus, and then systemic cutaneous lupus, which this is the skin rash of systemic lupus in our patients with systemic lupus. And then these are different types of lupus that do not necessarily present with uh, systemic symptoms. And so SLE, as you know, the patients classically have some serology pattern. Uh, classically, they will be ANA positive, Smith, you know, being more specific. But there's some serology pattern. They may present with a butterfly rash, what's called poikiloderma. And then this is typically a photodistributed rash because these patients have photosensitivity often. So with SLE, you see how this spares the nasolabial folds. It spares this perioral area. And there's some scale, but they have these erythematous plaques. This is the skin classic butterfly rash of systemic lupus. And they can have these plaques like this as well on the extremities. They often uh, have a rash on the hands that spares the, uh, over the joints there, which is interesting, as opposed to dermatomyositis, which is very different, dermatomyositis. They develop a rash, what's called a heliotrope rash. They can have nail findings, and they can have papules. They develop, um, typically can develop a rash on the face, but also involving the periorbital area. They can have a rash that's photodistributed. These patients typically present with joint pains, as you know, as well as skin findings. They can have telangiectasias under the, under the nail folds, and they can develop these papules called Gotron's papules. Okay. So uh, finishing up our uh, tour through connective tissue disease findings in skin, we have the writer's disease where the patients develop arthritis. They can have skin findings as well as ocular findings, oral ulceration and pain with urination. And they can also develop skin lesions that may resemble psoriasis. They can also develop plaques on the feet called keratoderma blenaragicum and then balanitis cercinata, and I have a picture of that. So this is on the feet. The patients come in with this horribly scaly red uh, uh, plaque formation on the feet, and then they tell you that they have problem pain with urination, they might have some eye findings and other findings, and it ends up that it is uh, uh, potentially writers. This is in the penis, you see these uh, ulcerated or eroded areas, I would say not quite ulcerated, but eroded shiny patches here, and with erythema, redness on the penis, and that's uh, of course a form of balanitis, meaning, and meaning inflammation of this area, but it has this uh, circinate-like appearance, meaning it's sort of like a uh, uh, kind of a wavy-like uh, border. Hepatitis C patients can have multiple skin findings. Cutaneous uh, findings would include itch, of course, which we also see in our renal population, lichen planus and porphyria cutanea tarda. PCT is con 
classically, they have blisters on the sun-exposed areas, tops of the hands. They can have hypertrichosis, and their skin can be very fragile. You see here, the skin's broken down. Porphyria, cutanea, tarda. As you recall, these patients often undergo phlebotomy. Serial phlebotomy is a form of treatment. They also respond to low-dose plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine uh, in some cases. But this is a PCT patient with fragile, eroded blisters on the hands. Hypertrichosis, excess hair growth. And then you find out that the patient does have hepatitis in some cases, as just sort of a classic uh, presentation. I want to focus more, though, on lichen planus. This is a, a very itchy condition where you get these purple-like bumps. They do get uh, findings in the mouth. 50% uh, of them are in the mouth. So when I, tell, when I teach residents and I say, you see something on the skin, you have to look in the mouth. Just like when we see a psoriasis patient, it's, you, it's not enough to look at the skin. You need to look inside the scalp. You need to look at the nails. You need to uh, look in the mouth, you know, oral areas too. So lichen planus, you see these flat top pyritic uh, purple-like uh, lesions, very itchy. And then uh, uh, not the best resolution on this, but we're trying to illustrate what's called wickhamstria, which are these lacy whitish patches inside the mouth. And of course, itching. They're severely itchy. Pyrigo nodularis, this is a nonspecific condition where the cutaneous nerves become excited and they become, patients become severely itchy. This is not just specific to hepatitis C. This could be seen in a variety of other conditions and it's not necessarily associated with systemic disease. But pyrigo nodularis, as these patients come in and they tell you, Doc, I'm just itching so much, uh, typically on the arms and, extra, you know, arms and legs. So again, as we wrap up, just some more uh, points here. Uh, thyroid disease, Graves and hyper and hypothyroidism. You can have similar lesions. Pretibial myxedema may occur on the lower legs due to uh, deposition of hyaluronic acid. Sorry, another typo there, but hyaluronic acid there. And so you see here on the lower legs these edematous like woody indurated patches uh, or plaques. And so this is uh, thyroid dermopathy. Hyperthyroid patients, obviously their skin uh, is warm, moist, they have flushing, they can have redness of the palms, and they can also have hair loss and vitiligo. So this would be, I told you earlier, vitiligo with depigmentation there. This could be seen in hyperthyroidism. Hypothyroid patients, obviously, is the opposite there. You think of the metabolism as being driven down. They have cold skin, they have cool, dry skin, they have problems with dryness, they have uh, generalized myxedema, and they can have a yellowish hue, so-called carotinemia, uh, yellowish hue of the palms. And then finally, uh, some of the very serious malignancy-associated conditions. These are not common, but you can have malignant acanthosis nigricans with stomach cancer and other forms of malignancy. You can have dermatomyositis that may be associated with a variety of different cancers, including uterine cancer. So when we see females with this, we're concerned about the possibility of gyne gynecologic malignancies, and that can be an early skin finding. You can get a buffalo hump from Cushing syndrome and then stretch marks, stria, which are very uh, disturbing, obviously, for the patient cosmetically. There is a condition called the sign of Les Artrelat, which is, le which is somewhat controversial because it's very rarely reported, but the sudden eruption of seborrheic keratoses all over the body may be associated in some cases with an occult undetected malignancy. Pemphigus, where they get blistering all over the mouth, they get oral ulceration, stomatitis, severe difficulty swallowing. Most of these patients present, pemphigus patients, they present, they can't swallow. That's the problem. So they go to ENT and they try to figure out why they can't swallow. And sometimes it takes a while before they get to us, to dermatology. But these patients in, with pemphigus, there is a subtype called perineoplastic, where it's associated with malignancies of a variety of different types. So blistering on the mouth like this that's intractable, not responding, needs a biopsy, needs a workup, and may need a perineoplastic workup to determine if there's any malignancies. And then just to finish again, a few other more rare conditions, erythema gyratum repens, may be associated with a variety of different uh, underlying malignancies. These are very rarely seen. Um, nutritional disorders in our country, United States, it's less common, but it's not you know, impossible, right? So, Marasmus, where you have a caloric deficit, Quashiorquor, where you have a true protein deficit, pellagra, scurvy, and zinc deficiency, we have to remember all of that. So caloric malnutrition, skin findings with marasmus, these patients are uh, emaciated, they are um, gaunt, um, truly emaciated, and the skin is very different than uh, in uh, Quashiorquor, which is due fundamentally to decreased protein, where they can have uh, more, they can have desquamation, scaling, and they can have, of course, bloating um, as well. 
Uh, pellagra, this is niacin deficiency, vitamin B3. They get dermatitis, diarrhea, and dementia. They can also develop a skin rash on the neck. So this is pellagra, B3 deficiency. Okay, Casal's necklace, which is this dermatitis specific to the uh, neckline. Scurvy, vitamin C deficiency, of course, they can get um, alterations of folliculitis and hemorrhagic folliculitis, and they can also get bleeding gums. Um, zinc deficiency, so this is not, un you know, not completely unheard of uh, that you get this dermatitis, diarrhea, hair loss, and uh, this, is, this can be acquired actually from a deficit in intake, high fiber intake or malabsorption, and these patients get these, these ulcers and plaques and, and various other uh, problems that can, it's called acro, meaning arms, legs, it typically has predilection for the arms and legs. But not only, I mean, obviously you can see that in the face too. Now, the, the nice thing about this is this is very quickly resolves with, uh, with uh, zinc supplementation. It, it resolves very quickly. But again, unless you're thinking about it, it can go on and on and the patient gets sicker and sicker. If, you, if, you, if it's in the differential and it's worked up, you get a zinc level, it can be very nicely fixed. Okay, so um, sarcoidosis, I think we already talked about. The skin can, uh, you can have skin rash with sarcoidosis and you can get these purple lesions like this. And then neurofibromatosis, this is obviously genetic, autosomal dominant, von Recklinghausen's disease is the other name for this. There's a, actually subtypes one and two of neurofibromatosis, but typically there's a family history. They can get what's called Crow's sign, which is axillary freckling, where they get these freckles, scat scattered freckles here in the uh, axilla. They can also get, as many of you have, I'm sure, seen in practice, these are uh, the multiple neurofibromas that develop on the skin. You can get plexiform neurofibromas, which are huge, and this is um, just something else, again and again, with the neurologic. Uh, tuber sclerosis, these patients often have a, a either lower IQ or some form of epilepsy or a combination, not always, but they can develop angiofibromas on the face, uh, grouped angiofibromas, they can be treated cosmetically, they can have nail findings as well, so-called Keenan tumors that occur on the legs. This is tuberous sclerosis, okay? All right, so um, again, I, I just was going to point out that these patients, you know, this patient uh, comes to you itchy, Lichen planus associated with hepatitis C, uh, lower leg there. This is a diabetic type 1 diabetic, necrobiosis lipoidica on the leg. What is this? Pyoderma gangrenosum. How do you know? Well, you can do a biopsy, but also the history. The patient has uh, IBD and has these ulcers, multiple non-healing ulcers, not responding to antibiotic therapy, and the patient has Crohn's, or more commonly, ulcerative colitis. And then PCT, patient has hep C. Patient has the, you know, goes out in the sun and gets these erosions and sores very easily forming on the skin, and they get that. What is this? Well, I think I showed you the classic SLE rash. This is systemic lupus, where it spares that part of that nasal labial fold, and um, so-called butterfly rash. Ulceration on the nose. This could be. Uh, this I put here because I want you to remember. It. Also, it's the common things too. You know, this isn't. You know, you look at this and think, okay, well, is this leprosy? Is this syphilis in the skin or something? Well, it could be something as common as a basal cell carcinoma that's just never been treated. Thank you all for your attention.